So good evening to everyone. And what I'd like to do uh, to start today's session is I'd like to just go around and ask each of you to give me some comments about your thoughts with regard to the course so far. And Kathleen, why don't you go ahead and start? Um, I've been enjoying it actually. It's just been giving me a lot of good information, um, especially when we did the that first project where we looked into like what grants and title money we got. Yes. And definitely still planning on doing more research on that. Good. Angela, you've already given me some ideas, but go ahead. One of the two Angelas. Jump out there. Um, for me, I would second what she said and the fact that like looking into the grants that each school gets has been really helpful for me, um, especially because I'm at a private school and I know that funding is different than at a public school and we have to be a little bit more creative with what grants we apply for but it was really good to kind of look into what we are eligible for and what we have gone into in the past. Yes, okay. Nawal? Yes, yeah, so um, I would like to say that I really like how this course is going. We are, I believe like we're all very flexible um, with the timings. I like like how the quizzes are. They have like the time was modified to meet our needs. Um, I like how you're like, were you're responsive to email like if I'm stuck on anything and I need your help I know that you would respond to me um as soon as you get a chance so I'm I'm very satisfied with how this course is going thank you Lanise um I, I love the information it's very useful um I'm just kind of learning like the back end of things and how like money works and the finances um, and I do appreciate also how quick you respond back to emails. That's very, um, supportive so for me, the, um, the part that I really enjoyed the most was, um, project, the project one, they gave me a lot of insight. It also gave me some time to like do some more like research on the organization that I work for. Um, it is good to know that it you take as like as much time to the quizzes, I'm just going to be a little transparent. I guess quizzes and tests have always been a little hard for me. I like um, verbal or like oral presentations um, a little bit more. So I, I kind of probably wish this a little bit more of like projects, maybe even like because that last one we had wasn't like a long one. But right. many projects I mean, would be a little bit more helpful just for like my learning style. Okay. Um, than the um, quizzes. I do appreciate like quiz four. There's a little bit more like short answers on there yes. as far as like um, the multiple choice part of it. Okay. Uh, the other Angela? You see you're having trouble with your... I'm back now. Audio, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Froze for a minute. Um, kind of the same thing. I think the course is going really well. I appreciate how quickly you respond to things when, when we have questions or, um, when there's stuff going on with us, you've been really responsive. And that's for me at this point in life is a huge part of taking these classes is having yes. professors that are supportive and understand that like, there's a lot going on for people. Yes. Um, the quizzes are the one thing I would say too, like they're just trickier for my learning style. It tends to put a lot of pressure. I don't try to be tricky. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, it's not that you're trying to be tricky. It's just for me in specific. I mean, I spoke to, I grew up with severe test anxiety. So even just the word like quiz and test yes. makes me, it triggers things that make me stressed out. So um, I much prefer the interviewing principles and the project-based stuff, like we the other parts of the course. Um, of the course yes, of course, you know, those quizzes are only about 25% of the grade, so right. they aren't, you know, a major part of the grade. So my reaction is you guys are doing well. Uh, and what I've found, having taught this for years, is that it seems like after 
the federal sources modular, things start to make sense. And I'm not sure why that is. I think maybe because students are a little bit more familiar with the federal programs than they are other uh, kinds of funding. But uh, you guys were pretty much the same. All of a sudden, I could just kind of feel the awareness of uh, what you were you're learning. Uh, so I want to discuss uh, the upcoming projects so that you are on point with that. Uh, the interview, uh, principal interview or supervisor interview is due on April 26th. And uh, obviously there's a, a number of things that you uh, will be talking to them about uh, with regard to the school budget process, maybe gathering data, if you haven't done that already, and also discussing cost saving strategies. Uh, which leads me in uh, into project two. But before we leave the interview, are there questions about the interview? And it doesn't, have, I think a pa two pages will be sufficient. A page to two pages will be sufficient to do that. Uh, I did give you some examples of interviews I've had my students do in the past. So you could look at that to, to get an idea. Always look at the rubric to see what I'm looking for uh, is always helpful as well. So questions on the interview? Pretty straightforward. Project two will not be due until May 6th. So you've got quite a bit of time to, to do that. And what you're going to be doing with this is uh, we, we've, we've turned the corner we, in this course. We've gone from the revenue side to now the expenditure side. Uh, and of course we squeezed in between uh, the grant writing. So uh, with this, what we want you to do is we give you 10 cost saving strategies. Uh, and just straightforward, do you at your school use this strategy or don't you use this strategy? And do you have a comment about it? If you don't, you know, it's fine. Uh, so, but what I want you to consider is after looking at those strategies, ask yourself and respond to, are there ones that we should consider more aggressively doing if we're, even if we're doing a little bit of them. The one thing that I've picked up already is that with, uh, with just reading a couple of these, uh, is that cooperative, uh, co-ops, you, many of you don't, do not participate in uh, co-ops and co-ops are a great way to save money for school districts. In fact, I went on and, and looked and, and, but this is for public schools. Uh, they have an opportunity to participate in an energy saving uh, co-op. There are a couple of other co-ops that uh, parochial schools may participate in, uh, but you know, that's the one that I think it looks to me like there's some opportunities. And you know, I, I think I began the course and told you a little bit about my history uh, with school finance and that I took over as a superintendent. We were $2 million in debt on a $4 million budget. And many of these cost-saving strategies we implemented. Uh, and so therefore that's why I'm so uh, familiar with them, I guess. And when I left, we were fortunate to be on a $10 million budget and we were $2 million in the black. Uh, and lots of people were involved. It just wasn't my leadership. There were lots of people that were participating to assist the school district in that. Uh, questions on project two? Okay, so uh, I wanna just make a mention of uh, the uh, grant uh, bonus project. Uh, if you choose, to do that particular uh, grant application. It too isn't due until the end of the course. Uh, and uh, you just apply for a grant. Uh, over the years, I've had uh, very simplistic grants that maybe only had two or three questions to apply. And I've had some more elaborate grants. Uh, the one that I remember that brought the school, their school district the most money was about a $50,000 grant, which was pretty impressive. 
I, I've also, uh, we, we had a, a there was a, 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 a fishing grant of some sort in Ohio that you could apply for and you got like $500 and somebody applied for that and, and got that. So, uh, you know, a wide variety, of course, locating it's always the darn hardest problem uh, with that. Uh, questions on, on that? Of course, your uh, budget preparation document will not be due until the uh, May 6th, the end of the class. And uh, I, have, I couldn't, I was really disappointed because Blackboard would not allow me to upload the rubric and the actual document that we want you to fill out. So sometime here in the next week or so, I'll be sending those documents to you so that you'll, you'll have those. Uh, so basically, and, and we're going to we'll walk about we're going to walk through budgeting today, of course. And so therefore, I'll be able to, to address that project as we kind of go along. OK, and answer maybe questions that you have. Uh, just one. I just got a, an email today that uh, shared with me and asked me to share with you to let you know that the course evaluation is now open and available uh, for you to complete that. So um, with that, let's get started with the content for the, for the quiz four. And of course, we're looking at modules 10 through 13, and those deal with grant writing. And we start to get into the basics of accounting, the basics of accounting. Uh, and one of the things that I want to, to stress is that, you know, when we got into education, we didn't get into this education to be accountants. However, it is something that we need to have some familiarity with, particularly regarding uh, budgeting and uh, and keeping track of the monies, okay? Professor, I'd hate to cut you off, but I actually have two questions about the yes. grant. Yes, yes. So my first question is prior to applying for the grant, do we kind of like need to get our school's approval for that? So, here's my my curbstone advice mm -hmm. is it's always a good idea to get your supervisor's opinion about whether or not to complete the grant because obviously if they are against it well even if you got it then it's going to be a problem implementing it probably because they aren't going to be going along with it it also it having individuals, the uh, principals of mine, who, when I was superintendent, who were applying for, for uh, grants, I appreciated them cueing me in that they were attempting to try this, uh, try a grant, because it made me realize that they were doing the, what they could do to support their school. And I always valued that. So I, I think the answer is, yeah, I think it's best for you to clue them in uh, see what they have to say. Maybe they have, maybe they have some resources to help you. Uh, but it's always best to let them know what's going on because otherwise, I mean, the grant typically is going to be funded and go through the school. Therefore, uh, the accounting of that grant is going to be a part of the process as well. Right. Okay. And then my second question was, where do we apply? Like. Uh, okay. Uh, that's always the challenge, okay? The challenge is uh, it, when when Joe Q Public hears about money for schools and they hear about grants, they immediately feel that there's just tons of money out there. And there are lots of philanthropic groups. There's lots of foundations that do, in fact, fund projects. The challenge is looking at what you want funded and matching it with a grant application. The, the other side of this is that uh, we're in a cycle. Gr grants are in a cycle. Uh, and it, it, they could, some could start in January, some could start in February on every month. So typically you might find something that you're interested in. However, for this grant cycle, it's it's closed. So that is something to think about. But all, my, my best advice, and you can burn up lots of time with this, is in the uh, 
I think it was module 12, mm -hmm. 11, no, module 11, I think it was. In module 11, uh, I gave you some uh, links to look for grants. And my memory is I even found a link with Michigan, specific Michigan school uh, grants for Michigan schools. So okay. spend some time looking at those and see if something matches. Now, the other thing that I would like to say to you is that if you have a local target, if you have a local Lowe's, if you have a local, um, let's see, Target, Lowe's, Walmart, those three um, companies typically offer relatively smaller $1,000, $1,500 grants. So sometimes you can even look locally. Uh, once again, having done this for a number of years, I had, I've had students who their school actually had a grant. In fact, one of the ones I showed you uh, or, or uploaded was one where the individual actually completed it uh, and it was through his school that was granting uh, the money. So it can, it can be anything that that's the challenge is taking the time and locating something that will fit your needs. I know that's a tough answer, but that's as good as I can answer. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, lastly, in the event, let's say um, my principal does not approve um, applying for the grant, or let's say it's too late, um, the grant that I'm interested in, it's past the due date, would there be another chance of extra credit like besides the grant application? Well, what I've done in the past, and I, and I extend this to you as well, I would offer you the opportunity to do what I call a mock grant. Now, with okay. a, a mock, a made-up grant. Okay. A made-up grant. So you make up the grant. It, so it's, it's fake, okay? And so uh, in doing that, and, and by the way, one of the examples I gave you was, in fact, a fake grant. I can't remember which one it was, but it was one of, one of them for sure. And what this student did and what you would do is you would answer all the questions, uh, all of the the areas that a grant asks you to complete, and you would complete that as if this was a, an actual for real grant. So that, that's an alternative. I I prefer them to be live, but mm -hmm. but but I also realize that yeah you know, that, that grant cycle. I mean, we are nearing the end of a school year. And typically, well, I shouldn't say that. Grant, grants can come out at any time. But but on average, you're going to see that grants will start at the beginning of a school year and then mm -hmm. gradually become fewer and fewer as the school year progresses. So as we're getting near the end of the school year, could be tough. Now, in answer to your question about whether or not you're, let's say that your supervisor says, no, don't do it. Well, my suggestion is complete the grant, but just don't submit it. Okay. You don't, you, you don't necessarily, I mean, I like to know, you know, I've had students who've told me um, a month after the class ended, oh, by the way, my grant was funded. Uh, and I think probably on average, I'm, I'm going to guess that 40% of the students' grants were actually funded. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, Many were not, uh, but uh, anyway, so you could go ahead and complete the grant. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't imagine uh, a supervisor who had turned down money and turned down an individual who's willing to put forth the effort with a grant. I sure as heck wouldn't as a as administrator, but uh, each, each individual. But there could be other reasons, like maybe it's past the due date or. Yes. Not so, so, so yeah, if that's the case, go ahead and fill out the grant and, and realize that next year that grant possibly could show up again and you'd have some of that work done. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you so Good, much. Great, great questions. Anything else on the, any of the assignments? Okay. So we're going to start off with the, the grant process, the grant application process. And uh, we'll ask you to briefly summarize each step of the grant writing process. Can someone give me the beginning, a beginning step?
No guesses? Well, you know, obviously, and Nawal, you are on, po on point with this. You got to decide whether this grant is the best fit right. for, for what it is you want. You right. know, if, if it doesn't fit what you want, then you move on to something else. So mm -hmm. the first step in the planning process is just looking to see whether a grant is going to be uh, a good prospect right. for you. Uh, the, the second step is forming a committee. Now, for your grants, you don't have to form a committee, okay? However, uh, Angela, who she submitted hers already. Her school actually received uh, the grant that uh, she wrote about. Angela, you want to spend? You want to talk about that, or she's still here? Yeah, she I'm might... still here. I just oh, my okay. off Yeah, I yeah. Would you here. would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, my principal and I found a grant through the state of Michigan for uh, mental health and safety and security enhancement. And we followed all the steps of the grant and submitted, collected all of our, like for, for the one we did, we had to get quotes in pricing from different companies of things that we were thinking about putting the money towards. Um, so we gathered all the quotes and data that we needed as far as what we would like to improve with the money if we got it. And we filled out all the paperwork and then submitted all the quotes and we were granted $34,000. And I think that that, is, is that one of the entitlements in Michigan? I believe so. I do too. I believe that's one that we talked but about. The amount is different. Pending. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, typically with, even with the entitlements, the amount is always seems to go along with how many students in the school, how many will, students will be impacted by the grant. And so therefore, uh, even with an entitlement, the, the amount could change. So, uh, uh, and you kind of hit on that, Angela. Another step is needs assessment, completing a needs assessment. Why do we need this money? You know, uh, you're going to have to present that at some point in time, probably within the grant application. So having a solid rationale as to why you need this. And of course, you know, with the mental health issue, uh, the state of Michigan determined years back, I suppose, when they approved money for the this entitlement, that that was a very serious concern for students in the Michigan schools uh, is their mental health. And so therefore they were allocating money to uh, support initiatives and then allowing people to decide how they're going to use those monies within an application process. So uh, those are the planning stages, basically. Of course, the, the next step is the one that Noel was asking about, and that's locating grants that fit the need. And once again, uh, you can spend lots of time with this. Uh, and of course, for this class, I would say don't do that. Don't spend tons of hours and tons of hours looking for grants. Uh, but uh, and. Uh, on the dis discussion board, there was a great discussion about having someone who is dedicated within the organization to be the grant writer, so to speak. And consequently, uh, schools that do that obviously tend to get more grant monies uh, because those individuals are dedicated and can spend time looking. You know, it's uh, unfair, quite frankly, for a teacher who's got a class, uh, keeping their, their uh, students um, active and doing this work on top of that, very challenging to say the least. So after we've located uh, one that we want to uh, utilize, then we start looking at the steps to actually write the grant. And step two is writing the grant. And of course, we get into the different different uh, components of a grant, which is the narrative, uh, the needs assessment, the objectives, the budget page, the evaluation, and maybe supplemental attachments. Those typically are uh, those kinds of things. I, I should also mention to you, just as an aside, if you really kind of like this work, you could you can do you could do this work as a consultant. Uh, in fact, many, the the resource that I used 
for much of this, uh, for much of that modular, the individual helps individuals become schooled and practiced in developing grants. So that's something that you uh, might want to consider if you if you like this work. Uh, it's not something that everybody likes, uh, but it is something that um, if a person really enjoys it um, and feels that they have the ability to help other uh, districts with this, their consultant fees are uh, are nice, I guess. So basically, uh, you know, those are the different parts. Now, let's get into the, the, the basics. I'd like for you to describe to me what's the cover page. Who can tell me what the cover page is? Kathleen? I'm, a, I'm going to call on people tonight, so be prepared. Because I, I, I think you know more than what you let on sometimes. What do you think the cover page is, Kathleen? Would it be the narrative? No. No, that would be separate. Um, the objective? No. Just very simple. The cover page... You know, obviously you identify your school district, identify who the project manager is, their contact email, their contact phone number, et cetera, et cetera. So basically just the cover page is just the beginning of the, the process. That gets us into the narrative. And Noel, L, how about telling me what the narrative is of a grant? Um, let me see. Well, It's like it provide like detailed description. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A, b a basic description. Uh, Sometimes it can be the summary. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be uh, maybe an, even an abstract, mm -hmm. uh, but it just gives a basic uh, overview of what the what you plan on doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. What you plan on doing? I I actually had a question, Professor. Yes. Um, at our school for fourth grade, there's a grant that allows fourth graders to go to a state park, would that yes. be something you can apply for? Okay, uh, so- For that, it's for them to learn more about nature and the environment and- Yeah, I understand that. So my question is, is this a field trip? It would be considered, yeah, it wouldn't be- Yeah, so be because it's a field trip, I would say that that's not a grant application. Okay, okay. now let's say, let's say that there was, Let's say that the school decided that you would apply and maybe approved or not approved based on the application, what you're going to be doing at that in this field trip. Now, I would say that could be considered or viewed as a grant, but more than likely, the school has already uh, funded field trips and therefore... Mm -hmm. You just have to request the field trip and you're granted the field trip. Okay. Well, for that one in particular, because I asked about grants and it, because it's a public school, it has to be approved and it's a whole thing. So I can't just apply for anything. Oh, well, that, um, it, so they told me that there's this grant you can look into and apply for it and we'll see if you'll get approved. It's not something that's part of the field trip budgeting. Good. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. That, will work. that will work. Okay. And, I'll look fact, more into it. Yeah. In fact, that's similar to one of the ones that I showed you that was a school-based application, okay? So, so that works. Uh, so then we get into uh, the uh, needs assessment. The other, Angela, could you tell me what the needs assessment is? Wouldn't it just basically be like, why does your school need it and Absolutely. how you'll apply it to the building? Absolutely. What, what are our needs? You know, why do we need this money? Absolutely. Goals and objectives are pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, the one thing that I always stress uh, is that, uh, and, and uh, the other thing that I would say to you, as I've said to my other students, if, for example, uh, this is a live grant, an actual grant, and um, we're in the cycle where you're gathering information, you're starting to put it together, but you have a few weeks after you submit it to me, then uh, you then can apply, you can actually apply it. 
And I've suggested that use me as a barometer and some suggestions as how how to maybe improve the wording, how maybe how to improve uh, the comments. So if if that would work, that's that's great. You know the budget page, uh, and we're going to get into this a little bit later in putting together a budget page. But grant applications typically use zero based budgeting that process, meaning that you start with zero, you know how much the grant is funded for, 25,000, and the objective is to fill in the uh, aspects, your, the allowable expenses to receive that $25,000, zero to 25. That's a zero-based budget process. Of course, the evaluation, and one of the tricks, in my opinion, uh, having put together a number of grants, uh, is to make sure that your objectives match the evaluation. If we say that we are going to improve students' reading by two months, we'll use that as an example, that's that's the our objective, then in the evaluation, we say, okay, we're going to give them a reading test. We're going to do a, a beginning reading test, and we're going to do an ending read, reading test, and we're going to see if they improve by two months. So make sure, I guess what I'm trying to say is, make sure that the evaluation component of the application matches the objective, the objectives of the uh, of it. So basically, those are the overall components of, of a grant. Questions on you also, you also have to make sure that your grant line, what your needs are line up with what the grant is offering. So you yeah. can't. Like if you're looking to improve safety and mental health, you can't apply for a grant that has to do with improving reading because safety and mental health have no, you got to make sure those line up. Or it's exactly. And you know, th that makes, that gives me an opportunity to uh, say to you that, uh, and you're right on point, Angela. Uh, so it's very important at the beginning to read the directions, instructions very clearly because Let's say that it says you have to submit, you have to submit this, you have to submit, and we'll do paper copies, which nobody does anymore. It's all online. But let's say it's paper copies and you have to submit three paper copies. Well, if you don't submit three paper copies, they're probably going to reject it right out of the gate. And like Angela said, if you don't match uh, the uh, grant with what they're fund, obviously it's going to get kicked out. It's not going to get improved. So uh, make sure at the beginning of the process that you follow all the directions. Uh, in today's world uh, with computers, it's all about how many characters you're permitted. And if you go over those, you know, you, if you go over those characters, well, and you haven't addressed whatever needs to be addressed, that's going to be a problem. So the next one is to identify and locate uh, funding sources. And I, I gave you about three or four. One is grants alert, and that's a very pretty straightforward, pretty good um, source. Another one is eSchool News. eSchool News is more for technology, uh, and it is pretty active. Uh, so that's something that you want to look at. The one for Michigan is uh, Me, Me Emic Foundation. Obviously, I think uh, Mackinac, around Mackinac. Uh, something like that, uh, foundation, that's for the Michigan. And those vary, it seemed like they varied. Uh, there's quite a variance from the lesser uh, funded ones to more uh, higher funded ones. And then FundsNet, those, that's another one. And FundsNet is a subscription. You got to pay uh, to be a part of that. I believe that's the one that is a pay. And so therefore, obviously, sometimes that's, uh, schools don't want to get don't want to do that. Okay. So uh, the last uh, objective there is uh, for bonus work, uh, you create a grant. Okay. Questions on grant writing? Okay. Well, let's move into the accounting side of school finance. So the first thing I want you to do is Tell me just what's the basic basics of accounting? What why do we do account? Why do schools, 
why do schools have to keep account of everything? I guess is what I'm trying to say. And what is that all about? You have to keep account of things because you need to make sure that you're not operating in the red or in the black. You have to, you can't be spending more than you're bringing in or that you have in your budget. So you've got yes. to pay attention to your needs versus what you have to spend. Exactly. Uh, we're not the federal government, so we have to operate. Uh, we, 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 can, we cannot spend any more money than we have to spend. So accounting is the practice of recording revenue and expenses, classifying it. And that's what these fund accounts are all about is you classify how you are receiving the money and how you are spending the money. You summarize, obviously report. And uh, the federal government uh, keeps ask schools to report, parochial and uh, public schools. And of course, in the meantime, it provides opportunities to interpret the data. Are we spending too much in X, Y, or Z? Are we not getting any bang for that buck? Uh, and of course, in the meantime, the overall uh, functions is one, number one, documenting revenue and expenditures. Secondly, financial forecasting, looking down the road three to five years so you, so you can uh, see the trends on what's happening. The budgeting component, the uh, appropriations component. We're going to get into that here in a moment. And of course, auditing. Uh, have every have any of you uh, been privy to your school being audited? I'll take that as a no. So schools, if you receive, and I can't remember the exact figure, uh, but let's just say that it's, 250000 If you receive $250,000 of federal money, you are required to do an annual audit. And what's interesting about this, although it's a federal audit, it is still conducted by the state auditor's department. And they are not only just looking at federal programs, but they're also looking at those other suspicious programs, suspicious meaning where money might leak out. And that's food service, that's athletic department, and uh, it's those those kinds of programs like that. So that's the basic basics of accounting. Uh, to get into some accounting terms, so we do in schools, we do what is called fund accounting, fund accounting. And fund accounting is a way to manage the flow of revenue and receipts through a set of funds specifically determined with regard to their purpose. We're gonna get into that in a moment. Uh, and with, with that, every state has what is called a chart of accounts, chart of accounts. Now, I don't expect you to know this chart of accounts, but I want you to know that there is a chart of accounts because all of these numbers that you see on monthly reports, and I'll be getting into questioning you about that in a moment, those relate to the chart of accounts. I gave you uh, the Michigan chart of accounts. Every state's different, although there are similarities. The federal government also has charts. Uh, and and uh, so the person who is specifically assigned to record this information must be recording it using those uh, chart numbers, okay? So the, the second is the fund. And of course, that's an account that's established by statute to assure that money is set aside, earmarked, and spent in the, as, in, as it's to be spent. So let's get into the specific fund accounts. The first one that you probably have all, all heard of before is the general fund. The general fund, that's the most important fund. Can anyone tell me what the general fund is? Okay, well, it's the chief operating fund that records all government 
revenue, and expenses, which are not associated with spatial purpose funds. Therefore, the general fund is unrestricted funds. Can you, can you repeat that one more time, sir? Oh, yes. The uh, general fund is the chief operating fund that records all government revenue and expenditures that are not part of a specific or special purpose fund, meaning this, okay? We learned about uh, the, the money coming from the state, the state foundation money. And we said that that money comes in and can be spent for any purposes. That money goes into the general fund. If, if you are a public school that receives property tax, those monies are unrestricted money, meaning they can come into the general fund. Now, as opposed to uh, in Michigan, within your state funding process, transportation is categorically funded, meaning the money that the state gives for transportation may only be used for transportation. Therefore, that is in another general fund type called spatial revenue fund. The one that you are probably most familiar with are two of them, two spatial revenue funds, athletic fund, food service fund. Those two funds are special purpose funds, meaning this, the federal government gives a school system money for food service. It has to go into the special revenue fund for food service. The athletic ticket sales are going to go into the athletic fund. Now, uh, while I'm on this particular point, the general fund could put money into the athletic program. And they do it quite often. Many times the school does not have uh, enough funds to pay for coaches' salaries, coaches' benefits, uh, those kind of things. And so the general fund often supports that program, that the athletic program. Likewise, uh, there are those uh, schools that they do not man. In my opinion, they do not manage their food service program adequately enough. Therefore, the general fund has to support money into that special purpose, uh, special revenue fund. Okay, do those two funds make sense to you? I hope so. Because so is transportation, were you saying transportation as part of the general fund? Transportation, in, from what I have learned, is in your state, transportation is categorically funded, meaning it's restricted funds. Because it's restricted funds, it will go into a special revenue fund. So it's a special revenue. Yes, yes. Those are the two funds that are really, it's important that you have, that you understand, you have a grasp of. The rest of these funds, nice to know, uh, but they're, they're not ones that at your level, you're going to necessarily be, uh, need to know, I guess. Uh, the next one is, called, this is also a government fund. This is called the debt service fund. And Let's say that your school passes, and, and once again, we're talking about public school, your school passes a bond issue to build a new school. You are going to be, and I don't get into this in this class, but I get into my uh, superintendent class, with a bond issue, a bond issue for a school is like a mortgage. So when you vote for a bond issue, and many of you could vote for uh, new schools, uh, even though you might not work in a new school, you might vote for a bond issue or vote against a bond issue. But so when a bond issue is passed, 
the money is granted to the school system for uh, as bonds for the building of that school because they're going to have to start you know paying for contractors etc cetera, etc cetera. they can pay it back over typically 20 years like a mortgage you have debt you have an interest on that money that you borrowed all of that money goes through and is placed into the debt service fund once again that's a little bit of a nuance that uh you know i don't, I don't expect you folks to necessarily know. I want you to hear about it, but you don't necessarily have to know it. Another one is called Capital Projects Fund. It's similar to the debt service. It's for capital projects. And we're going to start getting into some, uh, next week, I think it is, you're going to get into some of the terminology with expenditures, capital outlay. In Ohio, and I don't think, Pennsylvania, I don't think Michigan has this. In Ohio, we can pass what is called a permanent improvement levy. What this means is that we specify in the ballot language how we're going to, what that money's for. And that money is for fixed assets, computers, uh, could be remodeling a, a building, things such as that. That would be a capital project fund. So when a permanent improvement fund is passed in Ohio, those monies go into the capital projects fund. Okay, so those, uh, once again, those are all government funds. I, I only want you to know those two most important ones, the other ones I want you to hear. The, the next grouping is called propri proprietary fund accounts. Okay, proprietary fund accounts are just, uh, there are two types. One's called the enterprise fund. And what this, uh, what's play, what the money that's placed in enterprise funds are for uh, specific goods and services that operate like a business. Okay. That's, uh, I don't want to confuse you any more than that. Uh, the next one is internal service fund. This one you might want to know a little bit more about because if you are, for example, if you are, an advisor for a club, you might have fundraisers. That money, I'll tell you where that money is not going to go. That money is not going to go into the general fund. These students didn't sell those candy bars for that money to go into the general fund. That money is not going to go into the capital projects fund. That money is going to go in turn into an internal service fund. So it is a fund that is for things like clubs. And of course, uh, it, with clubs, the club, uh, have, have, some of you have probably been advisors to clubs, right? Well, the typically the advisor uh, or the principal has to do a budget for that particular club that gets approved. And they have to guess how much money they're going to be taking in and what they're going to be spending those monies for. And so there's a special account that's going to be set aside and it will be an internal service fund. The last two of these uh, are ones that you, once again, I want you to hear, but I don't expect you to know. Uh, they're called fiduciary fund accounts. Fiduciary fund, fidduci the word fiduciary means that we are doing something for someone else, okay? There are two types of fiduciary funds. One is called a trust fund. Now, this, is, this would be important for parochial uh, students. You may, you may have an endowment. That endowment could very well be very specific how that money can be spent. Therefore, it will not be, the, 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 when that money comes in, it is not going to be receded into the general fund because general fund is unrestricted. It's going to be placed into a trust fund, meaning that the school district will be the trustee for this endowment. Uh, 
when I was superintendent, we had uh, about three or four uh, programs where uh, the individual donated money for this to the school. They wanted it to be used for scholarships. And our job was to be the trustee of those monies and also ultimately select who would receive the, the money. Uh, in some instances, the, you could only spend the interest. You couldn't spend the principal because this person wanted that money to continue uh, as a legacy. Uh, so therefore, that would be placed into a trust fund. The last one of these fiduciary, once again, the school is a fiduciary agent, meaning they are working with another organization. The, the last one is called agency fund. Uh, oftentimes, a school district, within, this, within the school district, there might be a small public library. And that public library, obviously, uh, is operates uh, with the same kind of expectations uh, from an accounting point of view. But that's such a small library, they can't afford to have a treasurer look over and, and manage those funds. So therefore, they ask the school, there's an agreement that the school will become the agent for that, that library and the, the money from the library, uh, which by the way, on average can pass levies, uh, they, they take those monies and uh, provide the structure for that library to account for their funds. So an agency fund. So basically those are the various accounts. Like I said, the, the, the two that I want you to know about is that the, you have to know general fund. You just have to know that. There's no, there's no if or ands or buts about that. You've got to know about that. I also want you to know about the special revenue fund. So in putting together your budget, okay, you don't have to deal with the special, you don't have to deal with the athletic department, okay? Don't worry about their monies, okay? Now, if you are doing this as the school principal, yeah, you supervise that program probably. Therefore, you probably would have to have a little bit of handle on that. But for your purposes, putting together this budget, I don't expect you to, to do that, okay? So basically, I once again, these funds are very specific on revenue that comes in and expenditures that can be paid for through the various funds. Funds. Okay. Questions on that? You know, typically, uh, <laughs> like I told you, you know, things start making sense in this class after the revenue. And then I get into this stuff and it's like a glaze goes over because all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I never heard of these things. Maybe you probably have heard of the general fund. If you haven't heard of the general fund, I'd be surprised. But I know you haven't heard of these other funds. Uh, and, you know, it's good just to have a clue about uh, those endowments. That, that in itself is important for you to know that by and large, the endowment is not going to go into the general fund. So you've got to kind of keep your hands off of those, those monies and, and do what the individual, how the individual wants you to uh, spend those monies. Okay. So now we're going to get a little bit deeper into this stuff uh, because there's a, a I want to get into financial forecast. Michigan does not require public schools to do a financial forecast. Ohio, and I'm, I'm proud of this, quite frankly, Ohio requires every public school, not sure about parochial schools, doubt it, but every public school is required to do a five-year forecast, and they've got to submit that to the state. And as I was doing the research for the for the book with regard to forecasting, I did find that in Michigan, the Michigan Association of School Business Officials feel that forecasting is a best practice and they encourage schools to do it. 
They don't require it like Ohio. Ohio is one of the few states, I think the only state actually, that requires the submission of, of this. But what it requires you to do is it requires you to look down the road three to five years. If we are, and we're going to get into some budgeting terms here in a moment, but if, if we are seeing our student enrollment drop and we're seeing a 10% drop each year for the last three years, we can project that it's probably going to continue to drop, which is then going to affect our budget. So therefore, the financial forecast is, is important, uh, is, is very important. Okay. We've already kind of talked about audit. Audit is a, there are internal audits and there are external audits. The internal audit is one that the school district wants to perform themselves. Very few schools do that unless they find, uh, unless the board of it, board finds out that there's shen, shenanigans going on and they might want to do an audit of the books internally. Uh, but the external audit uh, is, um, once again, if you receive X number of dollars from the federal government, you're required annually to do an audit. Uh, and basically an auditor comes in and looks over your books and looks over, look over your purchase orders to make sure you're spending money the way it's supposed to be spent. And they'll, they will issue a finding if there will be a viol if there's a violation. And, and oftentimes the finding doesn't require repaying money or anything such as that. It just requires that there be a change in the way business is done, okay? So those are uh, the two important terms. We want you to make sure that you have an understanding generally about them. The next one is called GAP. And GAP is the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. It's basically the standards for financial ac accounting and reporting. It, and uh, it encompasses the rules and procedures. Once again, I don't expect you to, to know that. I want you to hear that word because often, in fact, I always tease my public school students. I said, you know, if you if you want to impress the treasurer or your school uh, chief financial officer, I said, just, you, just drop GAP on them. And they'll be, oh my gosh, you know about GAP. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know what those procedures are and don't care to know what those procedures are. I'm, I, I don't want to be an accountant, okay? Uh, so, you know, back to the, the financial forecasting, it analyzes trends, it recognizes needs, it clarifies issues for budget preparation. It facilitates strategic planning. So, I, you know, once again, I'm proud that, that Ohio requires schools to do this. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm happy that in Michigan, it's considered a best practice and individuals are encouraged, school districts are encouraged to do it because looking down the road three to five years is very helpful. Uh, it, it clarifies, because it clarifies administrative decisions, it encourages dialogue between school officials and the community about long range planning, and it ensures statutory and contractual fund balances, okay? So we want you to realize uh, that GAP are the procedures, okay? Uniform accounting system, that's the chart of accounts. Uniform accounting system. Once again, very, very detailed, very, very detailed. And as a chief financial officer, you are going to, that person is going to be more attuned to those numbers than anybody else in the school. And I don't expect, I never expected my principals to know those numbers off the top of their head, uh, it, it, but, it's, but I expected them to know that, that a chart of accounts existed because the chart of accounts become the method that you allocate funds and you, and you spend funds out of each of these line items, okay? Which gets me to the next point. So have any of you ask your principal to look at the monthly budget summary or the monthly appropriations summary. If you haven't, you should do that in your interview. Ask to look at that summary. 
because that summary is going to tell you the specific line items that are budgeted. How much is budgeted, how much has been spent year to date, and how much money is left to be spent, okay? So it's critical that as a principal, particularly, you can read that monthly budget or appropriation. And uh, maybe this is a good time for me to get into the difference between budgeting and appropriations. So I understand that many individuals such as yourself and many community individuals feel that the budget is a is a is the most critical document for funding. It is not. The reason is because it's an estimate of the money you take in and the money you're going to spend. It's a it's a budget. The appropriation on the other hand, which can be which is normally turned produced from the budget, you you cannot spend, I, I always like to stress this, you cannot spend a dime out of the budget. You can't spend any money out of a budget. There has to be an appropriation measure passed. And at that point, you then can spend money by line item, okay? So the appropriation is very important to understand those distinctions. So my principle, I got a complete, list of the of all the spending of the school district on a monthly basis and if you can see my hands that th those uh computer printouts was that deep <laughs> okay i glanced at them i looked at some of the key things but that was all that i did principals on the other hand are would only receive the monthly appropriation for their building. So therefore, they, they might have 30 different line items that they had to look at, 40 different line items. And those were all they had to focus on, those line items. But it was extremely critical that they could read that summary, that they know that there was a, the line item, uh, although there was a description typically, but the line item, how much money was allocated, how much money had been spent to date, what the percentage was left to be spent and how much money was left to be spent. Okay, uh, so that kind of gets us into uh, some of the basics of accounting, okay? And it looks like we're gonna go a little bit longer tonight, but uh, you'll just have to bear with me, I guess. Uh, so now I wanna get into the different budgeting approaches that a school may use. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Do you have an idea of about how much longer we're going to go? My kids uh, keep asking for dinner. So I just okay. you know how long to put them off. I'm going to say 15 minutes, maybe 20. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with the, there, there are different ways to budget. Okay. And in the module, I gave you uh, a, a video to, to discuss these various ways of budgeting. Okay, and it's important. Now you're into stuff that's important. I want you to make sure you know these funding approaches. Okay, the first one I've already mentioned it, and I'm going to mention it again is zero based budgeting. Zero based budgeting is very simple. You know how much money you have. You start with zero and you plug in the line items until you get to the amount of money that you get in the typically grant. Zero-based budgeting is typically used by grants, okay? So that's zero-based budgeting, that process. The next one is called incremental line item budget approach. Most schools use this budget, budget approach. Most states use this budget approach. Here's the way it works. If we have, for example, salaries, you, uh, probably no surprise to you, salary is the largest expense that any school, that schools have. So let's just say that we'll, we'll make this simple. Let's say that there's $100,000 that's spent by the school in salaries. Now, we know 
that there's probably going to be raises because people go up on steps. There will be individuals who will receive uh, their education, receive a, a raise with that. Incremental budget takes line items and increases that line item typically by a set percentage. On average, 3% is what is kind of used, okay? But you look at the historical, the historicals. For example, if, if you were in a school that was losing enrollment and your tuition was $2,000 and you were losing 20 students each year, you can guess, you can assume that you're gonna to continue to lose students. Therefore, you've got to decrease that income, that tuition income, okay? So incremental budgeting looks at each line item in the budget, that's those chart of accounts, and addresses a percentage. Here, here in Arizona, I don't know what the gas prices are in Michigan, typically Ohio, gas prices are less than they are in Arizona. We are now at $4.29 per gallon. Now, if you were building a budget for a school and transportation was a part of your operation, you have got to project 10% increase, 20% increase from the year previous because that those monies are going up and so uh, another very common phrase in budgeting is as far as your income is uh, project low or project high with your income, spend low. If you, if you spend low, then you're going to be fine with your budget. So that's incremental budgeting. Prob and, and so what does this mean for you folks? You're putting together your budget preparation. You will have a amount of money that was spent last year. And I'm asking you to also look to see how much money was spent the year before that. And you start to see a trend. If you see that that trend, transportation, for example, has increased the last two years by 30% each year, you've got to project a 30% increase on that line item expenditure. That's incremental budgeting. Most schools use incremental budgeting. It's, it's fairly simple in its concept um, and it, it's easy to kind of manage, okay? Another budget process is called site-based budgeting. And I've been in this profession long enough that site-based budgeting became a um, fad about 20 years ago, I suppose. Site-based budgeting, get the money where the, where, where the where the where it's being spent. There's only one fallacy with site-based budgeting on a district level. If you have three or four school districts, then you would have three or four different site-based budgets. That in itself is a bit of a problem, but uh, you know, the, the salaries are dictated by the district and their contract. Therefore, this, the, the school doesn't have any control over that amount of money. Uh, same thing with insurances. So therefore, site-based budgeting means that budgeting takes place at the site, the school. Now, the other thing I want to make sure I mention to you is that school districts tend to use incremental budgeting, they use site-based, they use zero-based budgeting, and they use site-based budgeting. The school that, that I served as superintendent, we primarily put together an incremental budget. Well, the, the treasurer did and, and uh, got my input on it. The, uh, we, when we did grants, we were doing site-based budgeting. And we were also doing, excuse me, we were doing zero-based budgeting with grants. And we did site-based budgeting for certain kinds of things. For example, we would grant 
the school X number of dollars for supplies. And they would decide how they were going to divvy up those supplies. We were going, we would allow X number of dollars for equipment repair, and they would decide whether or not they uh, how they would use that equipment repair. So there was a certain amount of decisions made at the school level for budgeting, but it was not the overall way we did business. The overall way we did business was with incremental uh, line item budgeting, okay? The two other budget practices are less used. Performance-based budgeting, the idea of performance-based budgeting is just that. You budget based on the performance. Kind of hard to do uh, if in schools because if the, perform if the teacher is performing poorly, does that mean they get less money? No, they're on a salary schedule. So therefore you can't do that. So performance-based budgeting, nice idea, but not overly practical. The last one is called planning, programming, budgeting, and evaluating system. This was old school uh, governments use this practice. They don't use it as much today, okay? So those are the different budget processes. You'll decide with your budget preparation, which one of these will you'll use. My suggestion is to use the incremental line item budget, but have a conversation with your principal about that. Now let's get into the steps in putting together a budget, okay? The first step in putting together a budget is to establish a calendar. We know that by October 1 in Michigan schools, you have got to have an appropriation in place to spend money. The, the state government has to have their um, budget approved and appropriations decided by that time, or they can't spend any money. Therefore, you work to, toward a calendar, okay? And uh, we give you some examples of that in the text as well as uh, in your assignment. Look over that. Uh, in fact, the Michigan, uh, one of the one of the government uh, uh, government agencies in Michigan suggests a calendar, which is kind of a good idea. Okay, the second step is collecting data. The, how many? What's our student enrollment? What's our staffing? Uh, and just a real quick story. So when I took over. Uh, and we were in bad financial shape. I looked over the enrollment, I looked over staffing and there were two things going on. I won't go into, I'm not gonna go into enrollment, I'm gonna go into staffing. At our high school, we had two business teachers. They were teaching about total 50 students each, two of them. So I said, uh, we aren't gonna do that, we can't afford that. Therefore, uh, I got lucky because one of the business teachers got uh, pregnant and was not going to be able, was not going to return for that next year, uh, took a leave of absence for the year. And I went to my principal and I said, we're not replacing her. So you've got to figure out your schedule by somehow, some way to take care of those students with one staff member. Uh, so anyway, you, you collect your data. As part of that data collection, you start to look at how much money we received and what were the buckets of those, where did those monies come from, okay? How much come from tuition, particularly? And we estimate how much we're going to have in the future. So once again, if we're seeing decline in enrollment, by 10 students, we have got to address that. That is, that's a trend, uh, it's a historical. And therefore we have to reflect that in our new budget. Back to my situation, student enrollment. Ohio started inter-district open enrollment. I was scared to death because what that meant was that 
the uh, student, the, the, the funding from the state was going to go to the educating district, not the residential district. And if, so if a parent decided to send their child to another district, they took their money with them. I was very concerned about this, of course, because we could lose money. Another thing that helped us get out of the financial issue is we gained 50 students each year. And so therefore we started to project that we were going to be gaining uh, around that number uh, each year. So student enrollment projections, uh, staffing, very important. Uh, you complete the general, general fund revenue estimate and you estimate the general fund expenditures. And next, in, in the next set of modules, you'll be getting into the specific terminology of expenditures, salaries, fringe, uh, fringe benefits, uh, capital outlay, supplies. Uh, you'll learn those kinds of things. And sadly, uh, and, and once again, people don't realize this, but sadly, the majority of the budget is on two items, salary and benefits. And uh, I've done a lot of research and if a school district is approaching over 80% of their total budget in salary and benefits, they be they're in trouble. They're in trouble. They better start looking at, at reducing their staff, quite frankly. Okay, uh, so uh, we, we do an estimate of the expenditures. As I said, we early on decide our budget strategy and we complete a preliminary budget. Complete a preliminary budget. And that's where you guys are, that's where you stop, okay? But just so you know, after that preliminary budget is approved or you've put that together, then there's uh, required in, for public schools to hold a public uh, hearing of the budget. The community gets to hear that. They get to comment on it. That might require a revision. Then obviously there's a finalized budget. There's a board approval with the budget. After the board approves the budget, it then gets transported into an appropriation measure and the board approves the appropriation measure. All must be done before October 1, okay? And as the school year goes on, you monitor your budget. And uh, what uh, principals do is they monitor their line items of the areas in which they are responsible for. I've already mentioned budget and appropriation and questions on creating the budget. And I know you're just in the beginning of hearing this information. Let it sink in. Look, when, when I send the forms to you, look at those forms and then have a very good conversation with your principal about it putting this together, okay? Questions on, on this so far? I wanna just mention a few key terms uh, and then we'll be finished. Any specific questions yet? Once again, we'll get into more of this at our next uh, session. Okay, a couple of terms that I wanna make sure you hear. One is called carryover balance. Schools are permitted if they do not spend money in a specific category, they are permitted to carry that over to the next year called carryover balance. And also building a budget, you should know what that carryover balance was from the year previous for the general fund, okay? So carryover balance, money that's not been spent. Uh, just a few grant funding terms. Uh, of course, you heard me use the word foundation. There are many private foundations, uh, phil phil philanthropic groups or private donors. Uh, and when you are putting together uh, a budget application, sometimes it asks for in-kind contribution. An in-kind contribution means what are you, the school, putting into this application. Sometimes it can be monetary, sometimes it is just non-monetary. And as you conclude a budget, and it, or excuse me, conclude a, 
a, a grant, and this this includes uh, federal grants, you do a it's called F E R final expenditure report, final expenditure report. Okay. So once again, for the budget assumptions, we make assumptions. We assumed that we were going to gain 50 interdistrict open enrollment students, which translated to uh, approximately $200,000 each year. That was our assumption. Now, usually we assu assumed it a little bit less than that. We were hoping it would go over that. Uh, historicals, looking at the trends, what were the past two years? What have been the past two years? With that, we can look at that those past two years, we can give an idea about the percentage of increase, probably increased. If that's the case, then we are going to do incremental budgeting around that percentage of increase. And once again, propane, gasoline, two very volatile aspects for a school budget because you, we, we, we live... We live in a situation where those have been increasing dramatically. And food prices, that too, has also been a, a something that schools have got to contend with as well. Uh, okay. Uh, encumbrance, another important term. And this is actually within the monitoring. So when you get your monthly appropriation, you might see the word encumbrance or encumbered balance. What that means is that the money, there's been a purchase order for an item. It hasn't been paid yet. The money is encumbered. The money is set aside. Therefore, you obviously, if, if you had a balance available of $500 and you had an encumbrance, of $600, that line item is short, okay? Now, uh, I just wanna make one more point. You can make these, you can modify your appropriation as the school year goes on. So for example, if you projected that you are not gonna have any equipment repair, and lo and behold, something breaks down, you have to uh, repair a piece of equipment, but you don't have it in, in the appropriation. You then have the ability to modify that and take money from another line item and move it into that. Typically, uh, chief financial officers have the authority to do that. That's the primary person who has the authority to do it. And every every board meeting, we were having moving money from one line item to another because at the end of the at the end of the day, end of the school year, you can't have any of these line items overspent. They all have to have either zero balances or carryover balances. The last word that I want for you to understand is unencumbered balance. An unencumbered balance is just the opposite of encumbered, meaning unspent money. Money is not spent, therefore it is eligible to be spent. So we, we're getting into uh, accounting deep, deep, deep. Uh, once again, I suggest to you, hit the key points, study the key points. You got to know general fund. You have to, you have to understand uh, at least two or three of those uh, ways of budgeting. You should have a clue about the grant application components. Okay. Uh, with that, you'll be in good shape, okay? Sorry, went over a little bit, but uh, it was just, we had to do it, I guess. Does anybody want me to email the notes? That would be great if you can, please. And once again, once again, I'll be, I'll be posting this on YouTube and you'll get a copy of the uh, video. Thank you. If, you. if you want me to email it to you, put your email in the chat, please. 
Do you? Does it matter if it's not the uh, Madonna? No, I could care less. Just whatever email you want. I'm going to send it from my personal email. I'll just share the Google Drive doc with you. Thank you. you know, the, the, I'll, I'll leave you with this. You know, first of all, uh, I feel very good where you folks are at with school finance. You, ha you have a fair understanding of school finance. Okay, now take one step further and let's learn the accounting aspect of it. Uh, because when you, when you start to grasp that, you then will really be able to have a, a good understanding of the school finance. But you see how this, this uh, how school funding, school finance kind of builds on each other. You have to understand one terminology to understand the next terminology. With that, good luck on the test. I feel confident that you'll uh, do a good job, okay? Can you hang on for just a second while I can? I sure, can. I sure will. I don't want him to go away. I'm, I'm going to stop the video. I'm if I offered that and then it didn't go through. I'm going to, I'm going to stop the video, though. Okay. okay. Which I've done. Now done. Okay. Some people might have sent theirs twice. Okay. Um, Angela Harris, it won't let me send to that email address for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Do you have a different one? Yeah, let me send you a different one privately. Unless you put it in twice. Oh, you put it in twice. Yeah, I put it in twice. Okay, that's what happened. It's just not letting me because it's already in there. Yeah. Okay, I think I have it. I'll send it to everybody. Thanks Thank for doing. Thanks for doing those notes, Angela. Thank you. No problem. I find it easier to watch the video and be able to look at that, and then just they can I add in. I understand. They need to. I understand. Have a good night. You too. Bye bye. Good luck, Lanise. Um, professor. Yes. You kept referencing um, the directions for the principal interview, and I couldn't find it. I was wondering where you posted it. Yeah, I don't know that I, I think I was pretty vague and, and gave you a pretty broad, pretty broad stroked instructions, me mm -hmm. meaning, that, meaning that, you know, I, it's important for you to talk about the, how they develop their budget, how you develop the budget. It's important to get information about uh, the specific line items that are in the current budget. Uh, it's good for you to know uh, what their process has been, uh, time frame, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are the key parts. You know, give me some time to think about that and I'll shoot you an email uh, because yeah, I, I, I don't want, I, I don't want you, I, I want you to, um, be very direct in your questioning because okay. it, will it will lead you to better responses, I think. Uh, the other thing that, I, that I'm just doing this off the top of my head, the other thing that you're going to want to ask is you're going to want to ask about some of those spending cost-saving strategies. Do we do this? Do we do that? Um, so that's another part of it. Um, but uh, I'll put together some... Uh, more specific directions and uh, give give people those, okay? Okay, thank you. I just, I know I have to schedule time with my principal, so I just wanted to kind of get yes. that started, and, that process. And, uh, as far as the, uh, as far as the way I grade these, I just look to see if if you had a good diet, good school finance dialogue. That's based overall. That's what I'm looking for. Is okay. To have a good uh, school finance dialogue. That's that. But I'll, I'll be, I'll give it some thought and be more specific in what I'm looking for. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. You have a good night. All right. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.